1961. Code name: Firefly. The mission: Modify a Fire Bee target drone for aerial reconnaissance and make it invisible to ground radar. The success of this endeavor would lead to more than 34,000 operational surveillance missions over Southeast Asia, proving the value of this new technology. Over the next 50 years, advancements in stealth technology led to aircraft such as the F-117 Nighthawk, the B-2 Spirit, and today's fifth-generation aircraft, the F-22 Raptor and the F-35 Lightning II. Stealth aircraft evaded detection in combat operations from Panama to the First Gulf War, the Kosovo conflict, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as operations in Libya. Today's stealth aircraft are nearly unperceivable to radar. They are designed to be invisible, inaudible, while increasing lethality on the enemy. Using stealth, airmen can penetrate the enemy's strongest defenses, threaten their most valued, highly guarded targets, and return home unscathed to plan the next mission. Concealing aircraft from radar was once a barrier, but now a barrier broken. And stealth technology will continue to provide a powerful deterrence well into the 21st century. The whole time, you're just thanking God uh, and waiting for that chute to open. Once that, that chute does open, you come off that hill uh, and you, you're just in awe. High altitude, high opening, hey ho jumps are one of our special purpose insertion capabilities. It is our first time uh, being able to do hey ho jumps in Japan. Two, three, four. We're always trying to train in different environments, whether it be the desert environment, the jungle environment of Okinawa, Japan. This gives us a totally different set from both those environments and allows us to train in a new remote area. And it also allows us the chance to train in some areas of the world that we may have to go into. Airfield management is responsible for just about everything that happens on the flight line. And in this unique deployed location, they've had to step outside their comfort zone to address issues like flight line repairs and installing airfield lighting. As airfield management, this is not usually our job. However, because we are deployed and we want to get our mission done, we have become very fond of these lovely solar lights. Airmen from airfield management do multiple sweeps daily to assess flight line conditions to ensure jets will be able to take off at any time, day or night. Tower of three meter virus It's in the evenings. Obviously, aircraft still depart. The mission still has to take place. The sweeps also help them find breakage and deterioration on the flight line. We'll have aircraft taxiing, and due to the idle or the exhaust of their engines, they actually are removing chunks of pavement on our runway. So what we're working on is fixing spalls. Once trouble spots are identified, members of Red Horse are called in to perform the fixes. 
One upside to the construction is that it's allowed them to make the flight line more accessible for partner nation needs. We just actually received the German Air Force here and we're actually looking for ways to expand certain taxiways and incorporate their aircraft here. Meaning not only can U.S. jets safely take off and land, but several other coalition nations can also stay in the fight to weaken and destroy ISIS. Fighter Squadron out of Spengalum Air Base, Germany, are participating in a flying training deployment to RAF Lakenheath in the United Kingdom. This FTD demonstrates the 480th Fighter Squadron's readiness to deploy at a moment's notice, and increases their interoperability within not only the U.S. Air Force, but also with our North Atlantic Treaty Organization allies. You know, we know that the next time that we go to war, uh, it won't just be with the 480th Fighter Squadron, it will be with uh, other platforms, the United States Air Force, as well as with our allies. And so getting the chance to brief in person, debrief in person, and fly with both the F-15s, like I said, HH-60s, as well as our allies in the Royal Air Force, it gives us ready for the next, the next fight that we're going to go fight. Training like this is vital for every member of the 480th Fighter Squadron. Whether it's their fifth FTD or their first, everyone is learning and gaining knowledge that will be pivotal to winning future battles. Yeah, I think the biggest thing I'll take away from this FTD was the ability to integrate with those assets, both the F-15Cs, F-15Es, helicopters, tankers, and the RAF aircraft. Uh, that's something that we can bring back home and it'll make us more ready for the, uh, the next FTD we go on, or maybe the next combat deployment we go on. As long as training like this remains viable, units like the 480th and their fighter squadron counterparts will continue to look for opportunities to improve their skills and interoperability. Yeah, you know, we're always looking for valuable training opportunities, and the experience that we've gotten here at RAF Lakenheath only makes us want to seek opportunities like this further down the road. The purpose of this training is to gain and maintain unit level proficiency in the static line teams and in the free fall teams for insert into full mission profile operations and you know, operational environments. It's an exciting uh, method of insertion, yes, but really it's, it's an extremely effective one uh, and we feel a lot of sort of exhilaration and encouragement when we get to that level of proficiency with a team. So low-level static line parachuting is conducted at a relatively low altitude, uh, something in the 1,250 to 1,500 foot range. Um, the parachutists are not responsible at all upon exiting the aircraft for deploying their canopies. It's in fact deployed for them as they step off the ramp. They descend from that altitude to the ground in a matter of you know a minute or so. Free fall, on the other hand, the typical exit altitudes from anywhere between 6,000 feet to 25 or 30,000 feet above ground level and can be accomplished with a mix of oxygen and a number of different configurations on the parachute system. It's an incredible capability that we maintain in the reconnaissance and special operations communities in the Marine Corps and we're proud to represent our company doing it today.
week, gunfighters from the 366 Fighter Wing join forces with the 334th Fighter Squadron from Seymour Johnson Air Force Base and the Marine Attack Squadron 223 from Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point for gunfighter flag. The exercise allowed each squadron to test their specific learning objectives while working together in a multi-service environment. This gunfighter flag, uh, like others, is focused on contested integrated operations. And so there's actually elements of all the different things you might uh, encounter in a, a near-peer, high-end fight. Joint efforts like this reflect how communication works between different services while deployed. When we deploy, uh, and when we traditionally have deployed, you find yourself on a base with uh, multinational and joint service partners uh, working together, not only on the, on the station, but also coordinating and planning missions and employing together. Uh, and so this opportunity very much mirrors what we do, uh, what we'd like to do uh, when we go downrange rather than being compartmentalized and separated as services and as partners. Uh, when we get to brief together, plan together, execute and then come back and debrief it together, we learn the most and we become a better uh, fighting force. As Colonel O'Donnell participated in his last gunfighter flag here in Mountain Home, he recounts how important this exercise is for the entire base. I'm very uh, happy about how the gunfighters uh, flags go, uh, the initiative that's uh, placed uh, in this and the focus to be able to make them happen, and all the people that participate uh, across the board, not just our flying organizations, but the entire base uh, supports uh, these events because it is above and beyond what we normally do on a day-to-day -day basis for our own training, but it is truly a great opportunity for us because it helps our training as well. It makes us better uh, when we do go to combat. So I appreciate everyone's uh, support uh, and participation. 154 sorties were flown during the exercise with 147 air-to-air -air kills. Planning for the next gunfighter flag is already underway. We conducted a low cost, low altitude, uh, LCLA for short, airdrop, uh, resupply airdrop with a CH-47 helicopter from 325 Aviation Regiment. We load the bundles back at Wheeler Army Airfield and then uh, once the bundles are loaded, uh, they'll take off, fly over here. And then the, uh, there's a person who's spotting in the back of the CH-47 Chinook who's given time warning for the person who's going to push the bundles out the back and then um, the person behind the bundles waits for that person spotting uh, to give them the sign to execute, and then they'll push the bundles out, uh, the parachute will open, and then it'll land where it's supposed to go.
department in the squadron and as well as AIMD ordnance on the boat. From the time we say go, they'll build up those weapons, uh, test them, and then uh, hang them on the aircraft depending on what we ask for for the mission. So the Maverick is called the AGM-65 Echo. It's a laser-guided uh, penetrator round that's designed primarily to uh, target armor uh, or hardened structures. The benefits the Maverick brings to the MU fixed wing armor killing capability and also an ability to target bunkers at range so it provides us some standoff from uh, some surface to air threats as well as an ability to weapon ear better toward armored targets. Prior to engaging the target with the Maverick the biggest thing I'm focused on is the laser marksmanship. Whoever's lasing that target be it the aircraft that's shooting or his wingman that weapon's going to go where that laser is pointed, so it's, it's absolutely critical that crosshairs of that targeting pod are kept on the target throughout the entire weapon time of flight, and it's a nice stable platform for that missile to seek in on and uh, kill that target. For the last Harriers on the 31st Mew, uh, it's kind of weird to think about. Uh, Harriers have been out here on the 31st Mau and then Mew for about 40 years. I guess I'm a little sad to see that some of the community won't get to experience a lot of the same things that we did. So it's a good opportunity. You get to work with a lot of our, our allies and partners all over the PACOM AOR.